Chapter 29 Squeeze DJ put on his jacket, grabbed his pack and rifle, and headed to the front door. On his way, he detoured through the kitchen as the wonderful aroma of frying bacon filled his nose. Was there anything more perfect than the smell of bacon frying on a cold winter morning? There was, he decided, when he rounded the corner of the kitchen. When the two ladies you cared most about were giggling over a cup of coffee, and both of them stopped to look at you and smile when you walked in, well, that made frying bacon the second most awesome thing in the world. Make that the third, he thought to himself, because the way Abby smiled at him right then just jumped to the top of the list. He loved her. That was a fact. So much so it hurt sometimes. Their relationship had progressed since disappearing from Colorado. Slowly at first, as DJ still had to deal with the guilt over caring for another after losing his wife. An adjustment phase was needed before he could fully embrace his feelings. Abby had been understanding and patient in this area, and her mother had proved an important person to talk to to help him deal with all of those issues. He dearly loved them both. After that night in the rain, he called Abby on his way from leaving Big Chuck's warehouse complex. She told him where they were holed up. They were in some small, low-rent hotel a few hours south of Denver. The FBI agents that had scooped them up were staying in the next room and were unaware Abby was having a conversation with him. He drove his way to her, and she talked to him over the phone the whole time to keep him awake. Even then, he had been so exhausted, he had almost driven off the road twice. By the time he got there, both Abby and her mother had made the decision to go into hiding with him. Neither had a desire to face constant FBI scrutiny and questioning, and there was nothing really to leave behind, except for Abby's acceptance to MIT. But she assured him she could create a new identity and background, they certainly had enough money to do that, and enroll under a new alias at a later date. For Mary's part, leaving behind the diner, her home, and starting a new life, well, it seemed an easier way to cope with the death of her husband. It was something DJ could relate to. The only things she really wanted were all of the family photos. But Abby had, the previous year, went through the process of digitizing the lot of them. She promised she would reprint them all in whatever size her mother wanted. That was enough for her, and Mary eagerly jumped on board. So, when he arrived there in the early hours of the morning, with FBI agents sleeping next door, they were able to sleep out undetected and sneak away. They seemed quite content to be riding alongside DJ in a bouncing box truck, headed to parts unknown. Odd, maybe, but DJ did not question it deeply. He just latched on with both hands and a needing heart and drove. Eventually, they ended up here, in Kentucky, a small town in the middle of nowhere, much like what they had already been used to in Colorado. With new identities and backgrounds, they were able to buy a nice farmhouse in the country. There was a spot alongside the house that had been prepared for a garden. A large glass greenhouse stood adjacent for wintertime growing. Mary was in heaven and promised fresh produce year-round. There was a decent-sized metal barn with electricity that DJ parked the box truck in. He started setting up a small shop along one wall almost instantly. Plus, the property ran all the way back over a large, long hill behind the house. It loomed over the homestead like a watcher with open arms a few hundred feet in height. Up there, he was able to establish a small shooting range amidst the trees. On the other side of the hill was a few hundred acres of unspoiled forest that the owner gave him free reign to hunt on. He missed his Box Canyon hideout in Colorado, but this place made for a pretty decent alternative. Unfortunately for Abby, only the most basic internet connection was available for her to play around online. He was able to order up satellite service to remedy that, it turned out, she really loved playing some popular online first-person shooter game. A good internet connection was a must for things like that, and she played every day. DJ tried to play against her once, but got tired of losing, so he gave up. She had laughed at him and called him an old man. It was not all fun and games for her, though. After getting a new background in place, she submitted a fake but believable application to MIT and was accepted for the spring semester. DJ was unsure of what it would mean for their relationship, but he was reasonably sure he would follow her out there. But he didn't want to just live with her. He wanted to marry her. He still hadn't summoned up the courage to ask her yet, though. All in all, 
things had settled into a nice, homey routine. DJ was starting to feel like a normal person again, even if he did have a new last name. It was a weird one, though, and he'd been wondering if Abby would even want to take it as her own. Kirsch. What kind of name was Kirsch? Maybe they would change it again. Maybe he could get his old name back without raising too many red flags. That was a topic for another day. Right now, he wanted bacon. Abby's smile turned to playful scrutiny. Now, it's too cold to go outside and play with guns, and it's too late to go hunting. The sun's already up. So where do you think you're going, mister? Wrong on the first account, he said. Right on the second, he replied with a wink. It's never too cold to play with guns. He walked over and attempted to snatch a piece of bacon. Miss Mary slapped at his hand and scolded him. Young man, that is my bacon. Yours is in the pan. DJ swiped the piece anyway and hastily began munching before she could stop him. While still chewing, he corrected her. No, ma'am, this one is mine. Yours is still in the pan. I'll be back later. She swatted him on his jean-covered butt and said, Just for that, you get to do dishes tonight. DJ laughed at her as he headed out the door. On the other side, he zippered his jacket and breathed in the cool Kentucky air. It was chilly enough he could see his breath, and he involuntarily shivered. As soon as he started his hike up the hill, the cold would leave him, he knew, so he set off at a brisk pace in order to get that process started. On his back was strapped a long-range rifle with a high-powered scope, chambered in 6.5 Creedmoor. This thing was easily one of the most accurate rifle rounds he had ever come across, but matched to the specially tuned rifle he had it loaded in and the hand-loaded round he had loaded it with? Well, it was a marksman's dream. In the hand of any seasoned user, it could drill a prairie dog at 800 yards all day long. The new round he had been tinkering with in the shop, he believed, would make that accuracy even better. He thought he had figured out a new trick that would create what he called the perfect burn. The cartridge to any round was never completely full of gunpowder. Shake one, and you could feel it rattle around on the inside. Because of this fact, the powder inside never burned the same exact way every time. There was always a subtle difference. In the world of accuracy shooters, where the goal was to make every round go through the same hole, any time there was a variance in consistency, it would translate to a variance in accuracy. So, if the gun did everything right, if the bullet was perfectly balanced with no microscopic defects, if the environmental conditions like wind, temperature, and humidity were always the same, if the shooter did everything perfect, and if the cartridge burned up its gunpowder the same way every time, well then, you would get near perfect accuracy. Of course, that perfect combination of elements never ever happened, but a true marksman was always on the quest to find it. DJ stumbled on a way to fill the remaining void of the round with styrofoam. The styrofoam was made up mostly of air bubbles in a lightweight form of plastic, when the heat of the burning gunpowder and exploding primer would hit it, the styrofoam would evaporate into nothingness at nearly the speed of light. Filling that void in such a way, however, held the gunpowder in place the same way every time. That would translate to a consistent burn. No variance. He had been testing this with a special bolt-action pistol, chambered in 357. In those tests, he got a nearly 30% improvement in accuracy. Today would be the first time he applied it to a rifle round. He was excited. At the top of the hill he now headed to was a rifle range he created by cutting a narrow channel through the trees, lengthways along the crest of the hill. It was just over 500 yards long, perfect for testing accuracy on a rifle round. The trees served to block most of the wind that would usually be associated with the top of a hill, and the thick stand of pine at the very end would form a natural bullet stop to keep them from flying into the unknown. Plus, the view was great through the trees. Mary suggested he get a utility vehicle, commonly referred to as a side-by-side, -side, to help make the climb easier. One of those small four-wheel jobs that drove like a jeep. But he enjoyed the exercise. It was good for him to make his heart pound, he told her. At the top of the hill, he paused to catch his breath. He was fully warm now, and despite the cool air, a thin sheet of sweat had formed across his brow and under his shirt. He slipped his hands into his jacket pocket, and his fingers closed around a folded-up sheet of paper. He smiled. Miss Mary had taken to writing out a scripture from the Bible every day. She would fold it up and place it into his jacket pocket. When it was warmer, 
She would sneak into his room when she thought he was asleep and tuck it into the front pocket of his jeans. As it turned cooler, she had taken to dropping it in his jacket pocket. Each scripture was painstakingly chosen by her with the intention of somehow making his day better. He loved her for that. She was a good woman. He brought the paper out and unfolded it to examine. Today's scripture was out of Psalms, and when he read it, it seemed a bit of an odd choice. He read it again, slower than the first time. He could see how it might relate to him, considering their recent past, but it still seemed an odd scripture to choose, especially now with the struggles of last summer behind them. Normally, she picked ones designed to be uplifting in some way, but this one was different. He read it out loud. Psalms 1839 You have armed me with strength for battle. You humbled my adversaries before me. DJ sat blinking at the paper for a moment, wondering how she meant for him to take it. He never talked to her about what she had been doing, he just accepted it. And she had never asked about what he thought about her doing this, or even if she had his permission to do it. She just stuffed them into his pockets, and he just read them sometime during his day with a smile. It remained an unspoken thing between them. This time, however, he might have to ask her about it. He tucked it away again and looked out at the view between the trees, waiting for his heartbeat to return to a more normal pace before he started his shooting exercise. Down below, along the valley road that led past the house, a car was approaching. DJ squinted and tried to bring the distant vehicle into sharper focus. No, it was a truck. An old one. The road they lived on was seldom traveled as it was well off the beaten path. Most people that used these bumpy roads lived out here somewhere, but DJ did not recognize the vehicle. He wondered if maybe one of their neighbors was going to get a visitor this morning. As he watched, the truck slowed, pulled off on the side of the road, and came to a stop. Making a phone call, maybe? DJ was now more curious. In the field of his vision, it was then he saw Abby and Mary exit the back of the house, two tiny figures making their way to the greenhouse. Mary asked Abby last night if she would help her with a special project she was working on, something about tomatoes and creating more light. He assumed that is what they were about to work on now. His attention went back to the truck on the road. As he watched, the driver's door opened and a person emerged. He thought it was a man, but at this distance it was tough to tell. The man walked to the back, lowered the tailgate, and began to fiddle with something in the back. Odd, DJ thought to himself. Chapter Break Perspective Change Jared Dane sat behind the wheel of an old pickup, bouncing down a worn-out back road in the hills of Kentucky. It had been a long six months since the death of his biological father, known now to the world as Big Chuck, six months that he used to invest himself in preparing to kill the man that had destroyed his one hope at a decent life. Jared was diagnosed with clinical depression at an early age, and it resulted in many difficulties for his single mother in raising him. When his focus turned to drug use, she was there for him to try and pull him away through therapy and tough love. When he then refocused his addiction to alcohol, she had been there to get him into another program, an expensive program that had cost her more money than she had and caused her to work three jobs in order to try and pay for it. Then, he lost the one person that had always been there for him, to cancer. The disease had been brutal to his mom, and it had been brutal to him as well. It drove his depression to new levels, and when she finally died, he almost threw himself off a bridge. It was on that bridge, preparing to end it all, when some of his mother's last words came back to him. I did the best I could for you, she said from her hospital bed. Tubes and wires were plugged into her to monitor her heartbeat, provide her medication and fluids, and to help her breathe. Jared remembered stroking her head as she spoke. Her hair was long gone from the chemo, but he didn't care. He stroked her smooth skin and cried. It's okay, Mom. I'm the one that didn't do enough for you. What you needed, what you really needed was a father, a man to help lead you, a man to help you become strong. I had you, and that was always enough for me, he assured her. Your father was a strong man, 
she continued, ignoring him with a faraway look in her eye. I didn't trust him, though. I hid you from him. Perhaps I was wrong. It was the last word she ever spoke. She died a moment later. Standing there on the bridge, he reconsidered her words. He began to wonder who his strong father really was. Throughout her life, his mother had always been vague about his father's identity, always changing the subject and saying they were better off without him. At one point, while he was in drug rehab, he made friends with a detective for the Denver Police Department. An older man had gotten hooked on heroin. Eventually, he came clean to the department. According to union rules, they couldn't fire him, but had to help him get treatment. Both he and the detective struck up an odd kind of friendship. If you ever need anything, the old man told him, just let me know. Consider me your get-out-of-jail-free card. Jared left the bridge then and reached out to the man. Was there any way he could help him find out who his father was? Maybe, the detective told him. He could take a DNA sample from Jared and run it against a database of known offenders. If the guy had ever committed a serious enough crime, there was a good chance he would be there. He was. Jared remembered the detective was scared to death to even tell him who it was. It made him swear to secrecy to keep him out of whatever Jared decided to do with the information. Then he unloaded on Jared just who his father was, just what kind of things his father had done to people, how many had died because of the man. His mother was right. His father was strong. He had gone there that night to confront Big Chuck, to tell him who he was, to tell him he wanted nothing more from Big Chuck than to just get to know him, to see if Jarrett could be worthy enough for Big Chuck to actually maybe one day consider him as his son, maybe not equal to the other three, but Jarrett was content to just get an acknowledgement from him that he was at least accepted. Then he had run into the killer in the darkness. He almost suffered the same fate as his father. He had not displayed bravery to the man, but had folded like a dirty dish towel and lied to save his own skin. Jared was responsible for his father's death. His cowardice resulted in the death of the one man who might have been able to teach him what it was like to become strong. The news had talked about a hero FBI agent that had killed the Mafia boss, but he knew the truth. Jared did not run across an FBI agent in the darkness. Jared had been confronted by someone far more dangerous and lethal than a cop in a suit. He was sure the FBI agent had taken credit for something he had not done. He was positive he was no hero, but rather an imposter. When Jared fled that night, he was sitting in his car crying in shame at the gate he had first entered. Then, a large cargo truck passed him in a hurry to leave the place. At the time, he didn't know his father had been killed by the demon driving away. He thought it was one of Big Chuck's many servants fleeing the scene. So he decided to follow. He would catch up to the man when he stopped, tell him who he was, and hope to join up with him as a compatriot. Hours later, as the sun was coming up, the man finally stopped at a run-down hotel in a small town. He climbed out of the cab and hugged a pretty-looking girl that seemed to be sneaking away from a room with an older lady. He realized then this was not one of Big Chuck's men, but the man he had run into. He recognized him from the bandana that was still tied around his head. His normal reaction would have been to just drive away at that point. But he didn't. He didn't know why. But he did know he was angry. He was mad and disgusted over the way the man had humiliated him. He decided he would continue to follow the guy, if for no other reason than to give his location to Big Chuck when he got to where he was going. It was later, when he was three gas pumps away from the killer, both of them filling up their tanks at a roadside convenience store, when Jared heard over the car radio of Big Chuck's death. A notorious gangster, they called him. Jared followed the man then for a whole new reason. It was for vengeance's sake that he continued to track his enemy. The man and his two female friends stopped at another low-budget hotel around noon. Jared had precious little cash on him, so he chose to spend it on food and gas and instead slept in his car in a parking lot across the street. He almost missed them leaving the next morning when he was taking a leak behind the car. Eventually, he tracked them all the way to Kentucky and began to plan their deaths, all three of them. But he needed money and a place to stay. So he did the one thing he thought his dead father would have been proud of. He found an old man living on the outskirts of the small town the three had taken up residence in. He caught the man working in the garden. 
walked up to him with a big smile asking for directions, and then smashed his head in with a rock. After he threw up from the horror of what he just did, he buried the old man among the tomatoes and squash. From there, he lucked out in a few specific ways. First, no one ever came by to check on the old man. Secondly, he found some cash stashed in the house, a few thousand dollars in an old shoebox under the man's bed. Thirdly, the man owned an old hunting rifle with a scope, a thirty-odd six and several boxes of shells. He kept tabs on the three people he blamed for Big Chuck's death. While he watched them, he practiced with that old rifle. He measured off a two-hundred-yard range and started trying to teach himself to shoot. When he first started, he stunk like an old landfill. Bullets went everywhere. Initially, he was so far off the target, he was not even sure where they were landing. Eventually, after reading a book he stole from the library, he started to get better. He was even now no real marksman, but he could at least put every round inside of a four-inch circle at the 200-yard mark. Not exactly good according to what he had read in the How to Be a Sniper book he found, or stole, but certainly good enough to kill a man and two women. His prey had been living in an older two-story farmhouse outside the small rural town of Rittner. It was an absolute middle-of-nowhere Kentucky. He had cased it from a distance many times. He would park about a mile away and then make his way through the trees until he could see the house. He wore camouflage clothing and used a high-magnification set of binoculars to watch his victims. He kept looking for some sort of routine, and eventually he found one. They hung out at the house a lot and only went into town for groceries and such when needed, but the older woman often tinkered in her greenhouse when the weather was cool. Her daughter tended to help. The man liked to hang out in the barn or hike up the hill to practice shooting. He did not know if the man was any good or not, but he did not plan on getting close enough to find out. This morning found him bouncing down an old two-lane road, headed for the farmhouse once more. Today was the day, he decided for no other reason than he was just tired of the thinking about it phase, and it was now time to turn it to the just-do-it phase. So today was the day he would kill all three of them and avenge his father's death. His original plan was to sneak his way through the trees like before, only get a bit closer this time. He needed to be within 200 yards if he expected to get a good shot in. He had no faith in himself at further distances. The cold had caused him to change his mind, however, and at the last minute, he decided he would just get close enough on the road, wait for them to come outside, and just shoot the first one he saw from the truck. If the man came out first, he would shoot him, then wait for the women to rush out and help him. If the women came out first, he would do the same thing in reverse order. It was a simple plan, to be sure, but if it was too complicated, he was convinced it would probably all go wrong. Jared slowed down as he approached the house. He could see it clearly from where he drove along. The house sat fairly close to the road and was surrounded on all three sides with small fields of winter brown grass. The tree line stopped about 300 yards from the house in all directions, so he had a clear view. His original plan involved low crawling into position and then using a fence post to shoot off of, but the back of the truck would work just as well. Plus, he could simply drive away when it was all over. As he pulled to the side of the road, wheels as close to the ditch as he dared, he saw the two women emerge and make a beeline for the glass greenhouse. There was no sign of the man. He was either still inside drinking coffee or already tinkering out in his barn. No matter, he thought. Ladies first. He stepped out quietly and made his way to the back. He watched the women carefully, but they appeared to not notice him. Perfect. He quietly dropped the tailgate and unzipped the case to the hunting rifle stored in the bed. Another glance at the women, and they were now entering the glassed-in box full of plants. No problem, he thought. This bullet will smash right through there with no issues. He climbed into the bed and approached the back of the cab. He swung the rifle up and laid it across the roof. It would make for an excellent shooting platform. He spread his feet wide and leaned down behind the rifle to look through the scope. He could see them clearly now perfectly. Each woman was now seemingly right before him, thanks to the high power scope. He snapped the safety off. There was a round already loaded and ready to fire. The real question was, which one should he do first, the old lady or the young one? He quickly reasoned that the man probably liked the younger one the most. 
He would take her out first so the man could really feel some pain before Jared killed him as well. So the man would know what it was like to lose someone he loved. So he would know how Jared felt at losing his mom, at losing his father, at losing everything. Seemed about as good a plan as any. He placed the crosshairs of the scope over the girl's head. She was smiling at the other one, completely clueless as to what was about to happen. He watched them pace around and talk with one another for just a moment more, savoring this final moment. Now, he told himself, it was time. Taking a deep breath and letting it out slow, he forced himself to relax, just like the way he had been taught, thanks to the book from the library. Once his breath had been completely exhaled, he held it where it was, paused in the middle of breathing. He felt his heart rate slow and placed his finger on the trigger. Slowly, ever so slowly, he began to squeeze. Only three pounds of pressure was all that was needed. So, he squeezed. Slowly. One pound. Two pounds. Squeeze. To be continued. (laughs) I'm sorry, but this concludes the first book of the Slaughter series. Book two of this series is called Slaughter Whiteout, and you can find it on Amazon, and you can also find it on Audible. Now, I I know this was a bit of a cliffhanger, and I apologize about that, and yes, I will admit there was a bit of a strategic purpose involved, but I promise you, if you head to book two, it's all going to work out. Book two picks up exactly where book one leaves off, and we'll answer all your questions, and we'll continue to tell the story. Because while it looked like it might have been over, I promise you, it's just in the middle. Now I want to take a moment here and make a personal plea. We independent authors, while we depend on your reviews, tremendously, a lot, like we, I can't measure it, we really depend on your reviews. So if you got to the end of this book this far and you enjoyed it, well, I'm humbly begging you, please leave me a review. Just please Thanks. You can also follow me at my website, jamesbelts.com. From there, we have links to Twitter if you're a a Twitter person. We also have links to Facebook, which I tend to be the most uh, active on, and you can contact me there. I also publish my email address, and I actually publish a phone number. That's right. You can pick up the phone and call me. So thanks in advance for reviewing this book. We'll see you next time.